I like Splatoon 1, I like Splatoon 2. AAA, what you gonna do? So listen up, here's the story. Splatoon 2 comes out and all your boys drop it like it's hot. Hot garbage, that is. People going left, right, and center saying the game isn't the same, saying they loved Splat 1 but not Splatoon, that the sequel is too different. How different? We'll get there later. So yeah, Splatoon 2's core multiplayer experience is different, and I can understand why people who liked the first game wouldn't necessarily enjoy it, but at the same time, I can almost find justification for everything the game does differently. I really don't think they chose to abandon their original audience, but I think rather they were forced due to, well, to put it simply, an interface change beyond their control, but we'll get to that in a bit. First, at the beginning of this video, you should remember, I said we'd get to how Splatoon 2 is different, and here it is. Splatoon 2's multiplayer experience is much more combat-centric than the first game. The new weapons emphasize shooting at opponents rather than turf, the specials are almost purely offensive, the endgame score screens draw more focus to kills and specials than before. I mean, even the bonuses you used to build up for just winning consecutively are now built up by winning consecutively with the same weapon. While the last game sat you down and said, hey look, this is a different kind of shooter, you don't get points for kills, you get points for covering the ground, this game says, hey, okay, that's true, but but think of it this way, you could walk around painting the floor like a scrub and boosting your own points, or you could pop a boy and then reduce the amount of playing time that he had on the field by the number of seconds it takes to respawn, effectively increasing your team's turf coverage like before and also taking away points from the enemy. When you consider that each match only gives 3 minutes to make as much of a dent as you can, a strategy like that does work. CJ from What's With Games made a very G video about Splatoon 2's Salmon Run and how it can be used as a learning tool and could help balance the game by forcing players to experience loadouts and playstyles they wouldn't normally bother trying, potentially introducing them to a new way of playing but also providing them a better understanding of the capabilities of their opponents. I'll give an example of what he was saying. In Splat 1, I never even bothered using the snipers because when I did, I was noobish and traversing the learning curve didn't feel like it was worth it. It, meaning I was missing out on a piece of the game and also that I didn't really know how to handle sniper wielding opponents. Splatoon comes out and I played a few rounds of Salmon Run while a sniper rifle was in the rotation and now suddenly I'm learning it and taking it into rank. By forcing me into it, they taught me one of my new favorite ways to play the game. A way that I'd never had a chance to in a safe environment in the last game. But another thing Salmon Run shows or, or, or teaches people is this emphasis on action. For a game originally about splooging the ground, well, this is a bit much. Salmon Run doesn't only force you to try out new weapons you wouldn't normally with your current turf war habits, but it also forces you to move and, and haul ass to take boys out, to identify the best times and places to perform certain very active tactics. You come out of Salmon Run and the old leisurely turf war just isn't the same. Once you've tasted blood, well, it's like they say, if you can't handle the tiger, get out of the jungle. Splatoon 2's weapons, modes, score display, and even map design make you want to play less like a Zamboni and more like a freaking fighter jet, just ripping people to shreds. The game gets people so amped up and competitive, it's nothing like the first game. I, I mean, the Splatfests in this game, the, the North American ones at least, the largest margin of victory so far has been by 5%. These Splatfest results straight looking like Quebec referendums, my dude. I wish I captured footage of it, but the mayonnaise versus ketchup one is when the game woke me, but I think it's also when it lost a lot of hardcore Splatoon 1 fans. The community engagement around Splatfest in this game has been completely different to the last. I mean, it goes without saying, but since the Switch is a much better sell than the Wii U, there is the fact that newcomers seem to outpopulate the vets, but also the vets who have stayed, like myself, have been converted. Now is this wrong? I don't think so. Is it anyone's fault? No, I don't think so either. 
Remember at the beginning of this video I made a really lame joke? Well, right before that I mentioned that I felt the hand of game design was forced due to an interface change. Yep, see, in Splatoon 1 you played on this, and in Splatoon 2 you play with this, and I think most of the changes in Splatoon 2's focus can be attributed to the differences between these two. Or, well, trying to make a decent sequel to a game without a certain aspect of the game's UI. I think I said the issue was that the UI was changed, but, but I'm sorry, that's wrong. The UI had an element removed, otherwise it stayed the same. You have your shoulder buttons, your gyro aiming, but what you're missing is the giant touchscreen in the middle of the controller. Here's something you'll notice about my Splatoon 1 footage. You'll never see me pull up a map. That's because I'm actually always looking at it. The gamepad screen had on it a live and interactive 3D model of the stage you were playing. That was a thing with basically all the best Wii U games, the ones that really took advantage of the special hardware. The gimmick was that you were doing whatever you're doing on the big screen WHILE you were doing something else on the bottom screen. In Zombie U, you were navigating a zombie apocalypse while scanning and managing items on the touchscreen. In Pikmin 3, you were assuming control of one of three characters at a time, while tracing walking paths for the others to follow in the meantime on the gamepad. This opened up gameplay possibilities, you could be managing inventory while you were shooting zombies. You could be controlling three characters while playing as one. In Splatoon, you were aiming and shooting and running and swimming on the TV while monitoring basically everything about the game on the controller screen. You used it to spawn on teammates, to pinpoint targets for ballistic missiles, but most importantly, to plan your next moves. See, the game didn't have waypoints or a radar to pick up all the enemy's locations. If you saw your opponent's color of ink spreading in a corner of the map, you knew that's where you needed to go, that's where they were, and you needed to put an end to that spread as quickly as possible. You could be in the middle of a standoff with somebody and take a quick look to see if anyone else from their team had flanked you and started inking someplace else behind you. I can't stress enough how important it was, at least to the way I played, that I could just look at what the heck was happening on the map over the span of a, a, an eye twitch. And it was also important to know that everyone else was doing the same thing. As soon as you started making a mark, you were announcing your presence to all of the opposing players and were putting a target on your back. Now, here's something you'll notice about my Splatoon 2 footage. You'll never see me pull up a map. That's because I'm actually never looking at it. Splatoon 2, without a map on the bottom screen accessible at all times, had to go for a different approach. They opted to make it a toggle that when enabled would take up the entire game's screen and would have a cursor controlled by gyro. We're all human here, right? I can't really put into words why this is bad, so I'm assuming I feel this way about it as a result of some inherent human trait that will make you feel the same just by showing it to you, so uh, I'm hoping this is enough to, to get across how not good it is. Like, I, I feel like this is just objectively bad and that all people can just recognize that. From user experience standpoint, it's not a proper alternative. It's not quick, it's not seamless. You can't just warp to a partner or a beacon at a moment's notice. You can't pinpoint missile strike locations, which is probably why they were removed as a special. And most importantly, you can't do it while doing anything else. You can't play and be observing your map at the same time. An opponent's coverage of some distant corner of your claimed turf won't show up in your peripheral vision anymore. If you want that sort of information to be relayed to you, like in the last game, you'll need to be constantly interrupting the flow of gameplay to fetch it yourself. A fetch, that's literally it. The difference between Splatoon 1 and 2 is that 1 is like a push notification and 2 is like a manual fetch. Very different user experiences. One is objectively better than the other, but evidently consumes more resources, notably a giant freaking touchscreen. <laughs> Do I think Splatoon 1 would have worked without an always-on map? No. Do I think they should have just put the stage's 3D map on a mini-map in the corner of the screen? Yes, that would have fixed this. Do I think they purposely stashed away the map in order to change the focus of gameplay themselves? I don't know. This is probably the most important question to ask about Splatoon 2's design, and I don't know if we'll ever get an answer to it, but for the purpose of this video, assume this is a no. So, with a second screen out of the question, let's revisit the description of Splatoon from before. In Splatoon, you were aiming and shooting and running and swimming on the TV. And that's it. That's what happens on the TV. 
on the gamepad you used to make plans about how to approach situations, and on the TV you'd execute them. So Splatoon 2 doubles down on execution, since it's all that's left. Things that happen exclusively on the TV that had nothing to do with the gamepad in the previous game, those are the things that the sequel tries to get its players to focus on. And not because it wants to, but because it needs to, because half of the gameplay is gone. What's on the gamepad? The map? The turf? Well, what's on the TV? The enemies? The other players? Go get them! That's what Splatoon 2 is. It's all about fighting people because that's the most impressive thing that you can do on the TV. That's why it also expands your movement options. Oh, why do you think dualies allow you to dodge roll? Splatoon 2 rejects the sorts of things that you spend time planning in favor of split-second reactions that win matches. I feel like in Splatoon 1 you could break each match down into a handful of moments, a small set of specific moves made in the three minute match that had an impact. In Splatoon 2, because everyone is always moving forward all the time, I think there are way more moments like that. This, I think, is why the new maps are more complex and interesting. They draw in more attention to what's on screen, they give you hiding spaces and areas to have shootouts, they give you tons of sneaky pathways up walls and hiding spots around corners to get the drop on an enemy or make an escape. There are also a lot more situations with direct vertical combat, like levels designed in such a way that opposing characters are right on top of each other, which I can't remember seeing as much in the first game. This is also why all of the specials are offensive and are tied to your character's physical location. The rain cloud is the closest equivalent to the missile in the first game. It's a large ink spreading weapon that the player gets to choose the target of. But unlike the previous game where you could literally point to any spot on the map to throw the enemy off in either an offensive or defensive way, to fire the rain cloud you need to be close to the target point and also be facing the direction you want it to move. This is not something you should use defensively to recover lost turf. It's quicker to just go there and, and color it back yourself if that's what you want to do. No, the intended and only real use of the rain cloud is to push back the enemy or weaken them in order to launch a strike on them with less risk. Splatoon 2 switches its focus to all combat all the time because at number one, it actually does it pretty well, case in point, the Splatfest results, and number two, because the gamepad was removed and I, I really don't think the same sort of experience is possible without it. A Splatoon could have only worked the way it worked because of that interface. Now, was there a demand for something like this by the previous game's audience? The answer is not no. After making my Splatoon retrospective video almost two years ago, I was reached out to by some active community members who outlined a ton of issues they were having setting up competitive Splatoon leagues and matches. Basically, the game had nothing in place to support that sort of experience, but it's something people wanted and they tried really hard to get going. And this seems like it was the response to that. Splatoon 2 does have everything in place to do this. I, I mean, look at this. Okay, so there was a bunch of demand for a stat tracking and battle logging system for Splatoon, and, and people had built their own, but Icolog, probably the coolest, was straight up an AI system built by a Japanese engineer. I'm linking a presentation said he made about it, but basically the issue everyone was facing was that there was a, a Splatnet API, which was Nintendo's own stat tracking tool, but it didn't have enough details, or it didn't have all the details people wanted, it really only had like end of game results. People wanted uh, more information, they wanted to pull more information about uh, the, the number of times they were killed, what weapons they were killed by, what weapons their teammates and opponents most often used, what weapons they most often died with, you know, they wanted all sorts of details that Nintendo themselves weren't even capturing. So <laughs> what does this guy do? <laughs> he builds a computer vision based AI and trains it on samples of Splatoon's in-game font and icon set, so, you know, icons for weapons and the, the bubbly text and all that stuff, and then he builds an app that in real time, given a video feed of from of the game from a capture code, you need to, like, you literally need to plug your Elgato for this to work, but the AI processes the frames of video and pulls as many stats from the images on screen as possible. This isn't an app that just fetches data from a database, you know, tell me how many times I got killed by a, by a certain weapon, here you go, that's not what it's doing, it's literally reading Number, it's 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 an eyeball. It's a virtual eyeball reading numbers from live gameplay footage that it's recording. <laughs> this is actual madness. This is capstone levels of work right here, and this was for people who really really wanted it. 
It wasn't for all of us, it wasn't for me certainly, but there were people who played Splatoon 1 very seriously, and from their perspective, Nintendo was failing them. <laughs> Straight AI researchers had to step up so people could find out how many times they got killed by buckets, Jesus Christ. Christ. I think it's important to realize while they didn't cater to some of the audience members of the last game, they gave exactly what another very dedicated group wanted. And I mean, Splatoon 2 is still just as accessible as the first, so all the points I made in that last video about it still stand. But what's great is that if you want, it allows you to go much further. I never used to play ranked in Splatoon 1, but in Splatoon 2, it's my favorite time. I like this game. I like the first one too. I like them for different reasons, but I, I like this one more. Future, the 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 future, the